In Isaiah 66, verse 13, the Lord says, As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. In 2 Corinthians 1, the apostle writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Dear friends, our God is a God who comforts his people. And this morning we gather together at the passing of our loved one, Tony Verbeek, and we look to God to be our comforter. On behalf of the family, I'd like to welcome all of you, friends, here this morning. Uh, It is good, the Bible says, to grieve with those who grieve, and so it is truly a good thing for you to be here with his family in their time of grief. Uh, On behalf of all those who are here, let me say to the family of Tony that we are sorry for your loss. It is a loss when you lose someone you love, and uh, and we are sorry. After the service, there will be a luncheon. All of you are invited to stick around for that and to spend some time uh, fellowshipping with the family and uh, sharing some maybe fun and happy memories with the family as well. Always a good thing to do. Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, you are nearest to us when we need you most. In this hour of sorrow, we turn to you, knowing that you love us and trusting in your perfect wisdom. We thank you for our wife, mother, grandmother, and friend, Tony Verbeek. We thank you for her life, for the joy she gave to those who knew her. Most of all, we thank you for the hope we have this day, that she lives forever in the joy and peace of your presence through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and even more importantly today, her Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Lindsay and Emily, I'll invite you forward to lead us in song. Thou wilt find a solace there. 
Thank you, girls, for doing that. And I know it can be difficult to do in times like these, but you did well and you blessed us, so, so thank you. In Psalm 24, we read what I like to call the bad news of our situation as sinners. This is what we read in Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? The answer is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Right, if you think deeply about what's said there, that is, that is bad news for us, right? Who can ascend, ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Truth is, that's not me. Uh, that's not any of us, is it? We, we uh, don't meet the requirement of ascending the hill of the Lord and of standing in God's holy presence. But that leads us to, to the good news of the gospel. And uh, we read about that uh, in a number of places, but let's turn to Romans 3, verses 23 through 25, this is what we read there. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And certainly Psalm 24 says the same thing, only in a slightly different way. But yes, it's true, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the good news. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, right? So we sinned, we've fallen short of God's glory, we do not meet the requirements of ascending the hill of the Lord, but as a free gift of His grace, God justifies us. God declares us righteous in His sight through Jesus Christ. He gives us what we need to be able to ascend the hill of the Lord and to stand in His holy place. Paul goes on, he says that we receive this gift through Jesus Christ whom God put forward as a propitiation or an atoning sacrifice by his blood, right? The reason this gift of grace is ours is because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid our debt before the holy and righteous God. And then Paul writes this, this is to be received by faith. Uh, and the good news of the gospel is that that, that if we put our faith in Jesus, we are declared righteous in God's sight and we can ascend the hill of the Lord. We can stand in his holy place, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is as our savior. And that uh, leads us to the application of this gospel, which is set forth in Romans 10, 9. The application is this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Tony did that, and that's why we gather together with hope this day. But that's, that's, that's what we're to do. That's the application of the gospel. God has provided Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement for our sins, that in Jesus we might be justified in God's sight, how do we receive that gift? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Of course, we not only have the application of the gospel, it's good for us to hear as well uh, this morning the, the great hope of the gospel. What does that salvation look like that we'll receive in and through Jesus? Well, Paul describes it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. And when Paul talks about those who are asleep, he's talking about those who've died. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And get this, the Bible says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so we will always be with the Lord. And then Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. These words are meant to be an encouragement to us, right? That Christ will return. The dead will be, the dead will be raised. Their souls, which are presently with Christ in glory, that's where Tony's soul is now, with Christ in glory, their soul will return with Christ and will be reunited to that glorified and resurrected body in such a way that eternity will be spent not floating on the clouds, but in real, physical, glorified bodies. It's hard to wrap our minds around, but that's the hope the Bible sets before us in and through Jesus Christ. Dan, I'll invite you forward now. Um, either one's fine. But why don't, why don't you use this one actually up here? It might be better for the camera so they can see you. It's right there. My name's Dan. Just going to say just a few words about our mom. By our mom, meaning the mother of Carrie, Danny, Vicki and Shelly. <clears throat> there are really so many things and memories of who, my, who our mom was, but here are just a few. Our mom was a kind, loving, and gracious soul that rarely had a bad word to say about anyone. She was also very attentive to her husband and to her children. When we were growing up in our country home in Oakland, she did not work outside the home, and she was always available for us. No matter what we were doing or when we were playing, if she was not tending to her motherly duties, she would want to come join us in our play. She would be out in the yard with us about 50% of the time, even in the winter, to help us build forts and participating in our snowball fights. In fact, when we got ready to go outside, it would be a race with mom included to see who could get dressed first to go out. <laughs> but like I mentioned, not all the time. For instance, one time when she wasn't nearby, my brother Carrie, who could not be with us here today as he is battling leukemia in his home in Maryland, was playing in the corn crib. He threw a large rock over the wagon parked nearby and knocked out my left front tooth. He said he didn't mean it. But dad took care of him later. <laughs> I know I can speak for the entire family when I say we have a very fond memories of our mom at the farm. I know Shelley was quite young at that time, so her memories aren't quite the same there. But also on our first house on 32nd Street in Holland. For myself, I can say without a doubt, she cared for me very much, even though I guess you would say I was the rebel of the family, certainly at that time. Everyone has one of those, right? <laughs> Mom worked outside the home at GE at the time that I reached that independent rebel age. But it never mattered how long I was out at night, or sometimes even all night. Even when she found me sleeping next to our little dog, Peppy, at 6 a.m. in the morning, when she would tap me on the shoulder and say, hmm, you might want to go downstairs, get some sleep, honey. Now give me a hug, and then she would go off to work. Not a bad word there at all. Mom welcomed also my closest friends, all of our friends, as if they were family, and always greeted them with a smile. The only place that Mom drew the line was at the cottage in Baldwin, at Big Star Lake. Mom and Dad purchased some property on the lake 
with what looked like an old shed and kind of an army barrack that we actually made into a small home for a while. But then several years later, the shack was converted into a garage and they built a log home on the property big enough to house the whole family. That was the plan, a place we could all be together, children and grandchildren. But in that new home, mom drew the line in the sand. There was no gray area in her expectations of this new lake house. No pets were ever allowed. And you never entered the home without cleaning all the sand off your feet from the beach. But we spent many summers up there enjoying the lake and just being together as a family. We tubed behind our boats, spent hours with our families playing in the lake, and evenings hmm, around campfires. And if you wanted, we would even teach you how to ski, even slalom ski. Some of the grandchildren would try on the beginner board that my dad made when we were a children. But the most famous quote from those experiences came from one of our families, who will remain unnamed for now, who was in slalom training. And he said, this time, no matter what, I'm not gonna let go of the rope. <laughs> And that's exactly what he did. Ask a family member later to find out what happened. You know, it wasn't real pretty, but he's still here with us. The Lake Cottage brought our family so much fun and joy and memories with mom and dad. Mom and dad also traveled extensively in many of their RVs over a 20 year period in retirement. They touched all 48 states. That also included a trip to Alaska to make 49, and most, if not all, the Canadian provinces. Mom was dad's GPS. They didn't have GPS then. So mom had the maps, mom had the plan, and dad went wherever she told him to. <laughs> but so you can ask him too about those travels as well as Vicki and Shelley who also uh, traveled with them on uh, some of those journeys. During those travels, for those of you that may not know, and in the foyer there, she mastered the art of glass fusion. There are several examples of this in the foyer. If you haven't seen them already, you can do so after. While mom was doing this, dad was busy making jewelry, using silver and many different types of stones. This is the tough part. I will finish up to say the most important lessons we learned from our mother mm, had everything to do with her undying faith in Jesus Christ. She taught us the importance of not just having a belief in him, but how to build a relationship with him. She encouraged regular prayers and reading in his word. Mom would always stress, stress the importance of asking God first in our decisions for our direction. And my greatest comfort now is knowing that God was waiting for her to take her last breath here on this earth so he could bring her home to spend eternal life with him in heaven. That is the home she loves best. Even during the difficult days and years of dementia and the confusion that she went through with that, her faith was still very clear and lucid as she would witness even to some of those caregivers that worked with her recently. In John 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In this world you will have tribulation, distress, and suffering, but be courageous, confident, undaunted, and be filled with joy as I have overcome the world. Then in John 14, 27, Jesus gives us direction and encouragement as we go on living on this side of heaven without mom in our presence. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Do not be troubled and do not be afraid. Go in peace. Thank you.
message this morning is going to come from Psalm 121. Psalm 121. I'll read it for you now. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun, oops, sorry. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, and Lord, your word is of much benefit to us. Lord, your word rebukes us. Your word corrects us. Your word converts us. Your word it comforts us, and this morning, Lord, we ask that you would do all of these things, and we do especially pray that, that by your word, you would comfort us in our sorrow and sadness and fill us again with the hope that we have in Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. As was uh, mentioned, uh, Tony and Ken liked to travel, uh, touching all 48 states in their motor home. I always noticed that Tony seemed to, to favor the landscape of the desert southwest with some of her glass artwork. I always enjoyed uh, looking at that. Uh, but she, she liked to travel, and it makes sense then that, that her and Ken would appreciate Psalm 121 because Psalm 121 is a traveler's psalm. Psalm 121 is part of a series of psalms which begin at Psalm 120 and stretch through Psalm 134. Uh, and, and all of these psalms are given the title, uh, A Song of Ascents. And the significance of these psalms is that they were sung by the Israelites as they traveled uh, to Jerusalem for one of the three annual feasts, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? At least once every year, uh, every Jewish male was required to travel to Jerusalem to partake uh, of one of these annual feasts. And, and these are the psalms that the travelers would have sung as they made their way to Jerusalem for one of those feasts. Now, the reason they're called Songs of Ascent is because Jerusalem is higher in elevation than the surrounding areas, and so when people went to Jerusalem, they would literally ascend. They would go up to Jerusalem, and so that's why these are called songs of ascent. But the main point of Psalm 121 is stated plainly at the very center of the psalm. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your keeper. That's the point of Psalm 121. The word keep or keeper appears six times in this psalm. The word itself means to watch over, to care for, to protect, to help. We might think of a, of a shepherd uh, keeping his flock, right? That means the shepherd watches over his flock. He cares for the flock. He protects the flock. That's what we're being told here when the psalmist says, the Lord is your keeper. He means the Lord watches over you, the Lord helps you, the Lord protects you, the Lord keeps you in his hand. And this is, this is a truth that Tony knew well. And I won't just say that, I think I can actually prove that to you in light of one of Tony's favorite stories. Uh, she had a favorite story that she liked to share with others as a means of telling them about God's love and of testifying to her own trust in God. The story was one that she read in the banner 
And the banner is the denominational magazine of the Christian Reformed Church, which is what we are part of. From 1968 to 2008, the most popular column in the banner was a column written by the Reverend Jacob Eppinga called Of Cabbages and Kings. Tony enjoyed this column and she was especially moved by one particular article in this column. If you've been around the Christian Reformed Church for some time, there's a good bet you're familiar with this one particular article uh, written by Reverend Eppinga. It's called The Blue Marble. Uh, I'm going to read it for you now. So just, just sit back a moment and listen, uh, and then we'll get back uh, to, to Psalm 121. A man stopped me the other day in a mall. He put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out a blue marble. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out a blue marble. We looked at our marbles, compared them, laughed, and went our separate ways. A bystander observing two grown men showing each other their marbles might understandably have wondered whether those two men had lost their marbles. The story of the blue marble began a long time ago. One of the astronauts on the moon took a picture of planet Earth. Today, that picture is well known. It appears frequently in magazines and books on billboards. I have it hanging in my study in an 8 by 12 frame. The first time I saw the picture, I was struck by its beauty. The earth appears as a blue ball with swirls of white and a few light touches of pink. The blue planet. Time magazine came out with a full page reproduction of that photograph soon after it was taken. That's the one I tore out, framed, and hung on my study wall. I contemplate it often. Sometimes when I look at it, I get lost in thought. I think of the one who made it and also of the ones who spoiled it. I am filled with the wonder of it and awed by the sin on it. How incredible that the blue planet stays its course in trackless space. Does God see me as I walk on it? Is he really acquainted with my lying down as Psalm 139 says? Once as I studied this picture, I remember that I had a marble somewhere that looked like it. Having been a regional marble champion once upon a time, I still had an assortment of leftovers from my marbling days. One of them, old Bluey, a bit nicked and chipped, bore an amazing resemblance to the picture on the wall. I put it in my pocket. A few weeks later, while casting about for an idea for a children's message for the coming Sunday, my fingers, playing with the blue marble, gave me an idea. It worked out pretty well. The children came forward and I showed them my blue marble. I told them about the picture of planet Earth and how my blue marble reminded me of it. I said that God holds the world in his hands just like I hold the blue marble in my hands. I said that sometimes I forget about my blue marble but God never forgets the world. I said that sometimes I lose or misplace my blue marble, but God never loses or misplaces us. I showed them the chip in my blue marble, pointing out that it wasn't perfect. But I added, this isn't a perfect world either because of sin. Then we all sang, he's got the whole world in his hands. I told the children to get a blue marble of their own and put it on their dressers in their bedrooms. It would remind them each time they looked at it, he's got the whole world in his hands. The following week, a few children showed me their blue marbles. Since the world premiere of my blue marbles children's message, I have repeated it for other children in many other churches. Once I did it in the same church twice by request, and once I told it at a funeral by request. Today, children here and there have blue marbles, even some adults do, like the man in the mall. My blue marble also helps me witness to others. When I make purchases in stores and sort out my handful of change, I make sure that my blue marble is visible among the pennies and nickels, hoping that it might elicit some comment. Often clerks will simply ignore it. But when they do ask what I want them to ask, what are you doing with a marble? I have them where I want them. Their query is my opportunity. I tell them that my blue marble looks just like the beautiful blue planet on which we live. I say that when I hold it, I am reminded that he's got the whole world in his hands. This happened again last week, and the clerk said amen. Wonderful. 
So get yourself a blue marble. No, this is not a commercial. I'm not in the blue marble business. But if you get one and we meet somewhere, you can show me yours and I'll show you mine. Then we can both rejoice that God so loves the world he made that he not only holds it up, but gave it his only begotten son. Tony loved that story so much that she took the application literally and began carrying around with her blue marbles. I think you guys found some in her coat pocket just last week, going through her stuff, a couple blue marbles in her coat pocket, on the shelf at home, right? In the china cabinet, I believe. A bag to this day of blue marbles. Once when her and Ken were RVing around the country, it was her turn to give the Sunday morning devotion with those they were traveling with. What did she use to give that Sunday morning devotion? She used blue marbles, and she reminded the folks with them that God has made this world and that he holds this world in his hands and that he's redeemed this world through the blood of his son. And then she, she challenged the folks to get their own blue marbles in order that they might use them to witness to others. All right, Tony loved the story of the blue marble. She loved the simple reminder that it gave that God holds the whole world in his hands, that God holds us in his hands. She knew the truth of Psalm 121, right? The Lord is your keeper. And what better way of showing that than by holding the blue marble in your hand? I want you to hear this morning what the psalmist says in Psalm 121, verse 8. Because in Psalm 121, verse 8, the psalmist concludes with these words, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Just think about those words with me for a moment. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Now, for the Israelites, those words would have certainly been understood in relation to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where they were heading. Jerusalem was really the, the center of their life uh, in the old covenant days. Uh, as they went out from Jerusalem to head home from the feast, they would have understood the Lord will, the Lord will keep their, their going out. As they came to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, they would have understood the Lord will keep their, their coming in, all right? They, they would have understand these words going out and coming in in relation to the holy city, to Jerusalem. In my own life, I've always understood these words in Psalm 121, verse 8, in relation to my home. The Lord watches over my going out from home, whether it's in the morning for work or in the evening for a meeting or on vacation with my family, right? He watches over my going out from home. And he also watches over my, my coming back in. He, he watches over my, my returning home. That's, that's how I understand these words as in reference to my home, but you know, when you, when you read these words from Psalm 20, 121, verse 8, uh, in the presence of a coffin, I think they take on new meaning. Because you see, in the presence of a coffin, going out only means one thing. It means going out from this world going out from this life, going out in death, right? The Lord will keep your going out. It means one thing to us right now. And yet the psalm teaches that even in this, even in this, the Lord, the Lord keeps his people. And really it can be no other way, right? Because the psalmist says the Lord will, will keep you from this time forth and forevermore. That word forevermore stretches out beyond our earthly existence. It stretches out into eternity. Of course, when you think about it, what is, what is from our perspective here on earth, a, a going is also from another perspective very much a coming, isn't it? It's a coming into glory. 
It's a coming into heaven. It's a coming into one's reward. It's a coming into the arms of Jesus. It's a coming into the blessed presence of God. And that's, that's what happened to Tony when she went out from us last Sunday morning. She came into glory. And Psalm 121 tells us the Lord watched over it all. He will, he will watch over your, your going out and your coming in, both now and forevermore. You're going out and coming in from Jerusalem. You're going out and coming in from your home. You're going out and coming in from this life to the next. Psalm 116 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Indeed, it's, it's true. It can be no other way. For scripture says to the believer, the, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And for all eternity. Tony knew that. Tony experienced that in her life. Tony continues to experience the truth of Psalm 121. Even right now. Even now in death. More than she's ever known in her life, in fact. The Lord is her keeper. Now here's the deal. All of us will go out from this life as Tony did. All of us will, will, will die. Some of us sooner, some of us later, but all of us, save for the Lord's coming beforehand, will die. The question each of us has to answer this morning is, to where will we come after we die? Where will we come after we, after we go from this life? Will we, will we come into glory? Will we come into our heavenly reward? Will we come into the arms of Jesus as Tony did? My hope this morning is that all of us will say yes. That's where I'm going. That's where I'll come to. But you must know there's only one way. One way for sinners like us to enter glory. And it's through Jesus. I, uh, I loved to be able to hear, and I just heard a microscopic amount, uh, but I love to be able to hear about, about Tony this past week. And as I sat with Ken and the kids the other day, they were able to tell me about her. And you know, here's some of the things I heard. Uh, she was a budget keeper always knew exactly how much every trip to the store was going to cost. And if she went to the grocery and they rang her up and it was even a few pennies more than what she expected, they were, they were going to hear about it. And they were probably wrong because she had it figured out. She was very protective and caring of her children. She was neat, clean, and organized. House was spotless. She was welcoming and hospitable to whoever came into her life and into her home. And I know she was always that way to me. I've been here a year and a half, met her a year and a half ago. The first time I met her, she was welcoming to me. One of my favorite details is that she made almost every event for her grandkids. And, you know, some of you grandparents might think, well, yeah, that's, that's good. I do the same. But you have, must understand, many of her grandkids were out of state. She was making every event for grandkids living in New Jersey. She still made it. Now, all of those are, are qualities we admire. All of those are qualities that made Tony, from our perspective, a, a good woman. And yet, we ought to remember the good news of the gospel. And it's that Tony wasn't saved because of who she was, she was saved because of who her Savior was. Tony had said in her heart, my help comes from the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 
And in that confession, she was saved. Let me ask you here this morning, have you made that confession? Have you said in your heart, in your soul, my help comes from the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth? Apart from that confession, you you remain lost and dead in your sins. Apart from that confession, you, you will not know the joy and gladness in heaven. It is only as you call on the Lord that you will be saved. And so in the shadow of the coffin, each of us does well to recognize our mortality. Each of us does well to recognize that no matter how much we might not want to think about it, how much we might go through life trying to deny it, we will be called to stand before the Lord and face judgment. Apart from Christ, we have no hope. But in Christ, we will be saved. For the God who holds This world and everything in it in his hand is also the God who loved it so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise that you are our keeper. We give you thanks and praise that you are our keeper in life and that you are also our keeper in death. Lord, help us to do what Tony did and to say in our hearts, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Girls are going to come and sing again. I come to the garden. Falling. 
Friends and family, receive now the parting blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. And all of God's people said, amen.